particularly gratifying to have uh, the opportunity to uh, introduce perhaps this information to those of you who are not part of the research community uh, who may have not actually heard too much about genetics, uh, and particularly genetics of borderline personality disorder. Um, <clears throat> so, so today I'm going to be talking about um, what's a relatively new area of study with BPD. Um, I'm going to say first a few words about the, the what and the why of genetics research, how we do it and why we do it. Um, I, then I'm also going to briefly present some findings from our group that illustrate some of the effects that uh, seem to be important with borderline personality disorder and also that uh, illustrate some of the complexities that we have to deal with when we're doing this kind of research. So um, I want to begin just by posing a question which uh, I, a lot of presenters have actually answered to a certain extent so far uh, during the conference proceedings, uh, and that's the question of whether there are vulnerabilities to, to BPD. Um, one of the main underlying tenets of genetics research with complex disorders is the idea that um, there's some set of pre-existing conditions that uh, increase risk for the development of the disorder. And if we ask this question of, of, of BPD, whether there are vulnerabilities, this is actually, you'll see what uh, people have been hypothesizing for decades now. Um, here are two quotes from uh, two well-known BPD theorists. One is from Otto Kernberg, uh, another from Marshall Linehan. Uh, the key issue here with, uh, with both of these theorists is that uh, although they come from very different traditions, uh, both view BPD as a disorder that develops through an interaction between environmental stressors and, uh, to use Kernberg's words, uh, a constitutionally determined predisposition or vulnerability. Uh, if we want to study these types of predispositions, an ideal place to look is at uh, genetics. So here you see a model of, of, of double-stranded DNA, a segment of which constitutes a gene. Um, broadly speaking, the end result of, uh, although this is a simplification, uh, the end result is, um, is uh, some degree of influence on a range of processes and characteristics, many of which could be described as traits of some sort. Uh, we could group these traits into different types, such as physical characteristics, like eye color or hair color, or uh, behavioral traits or personality traits. What I'm going to be talking about most today is uh, the third type that's listed here, which is uh, the predisposition to the development of uh, a disorder or a disease. Uh, although, although there's many ways of studying genetics, the, the method that we've devoted the most effort to um, at this point in our research program is the study of what are called single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, they're illustrated here with this, uh, this graphic. As you can see, the, the DNA strand 1 along the top um, differs from DNA strand 2. I got my pointer here. Uh, basically, at, at one single base pair location. And you see the substitution is a C for a T. And uh, those, those Cs, are the letters stand for uh, the nucleotides, which are called cytosine and uh, thymine. Uh, there's several different possible, there's several possible ways that this type of polymorphism could exert its influence. Uh, one of which is through uh, what's called a functional change, in which the polymorphism actually leads to a change in the structure of whatever, uh, whatever protein the DNA is involved in creating. Uh, another way is, uh, is through uh, basically uh, the, the polymorphism, polymorphism can serve as a proxy for another part of the genome with which it's very highly correlated. Um, so not all polymorphisms actually have a functional effect or cause a change. As I said, with, uh, with complex disorders, we generally assume that uh, genetics increase risk rather than act in a causative manner. Um, so, and by complex disorder, I mean uh, disorders like BPD that are assumed to be influenced by many genes acting together. Um, the genes all interact to influence what's called the phenotype, which is the, uh, the end result or the, the, the manifestation of the disorder, the things that you see. Uh, another idea that's increasingly gaining favor, and some people have mentioned this as well, is the idea of endophenotypes or, or intermediate phenotypes. These are um, these are, are traits or processes that are considered to be uh, intermediate between the genetics and the disorder itself, and they're uh, assumed to, uh, to, to, meet, to be mediators between the, the, the genetic effects, the biological effects, and the disorder. Uh, 
the, this idea hasn't really been fully developed with BPD, and there hasn't been a lot of research in it. Uh, but uh, a good example, as, as Barbara mentioned yesterday, is something like uh, emotional sensitivity. You think of this as something, as a, a core aspect of BPD that, that might underlie some of the symptomatology. And, uh, and which also could actually exist in, in others uh, without BPD. So something that could be kind of distributed in the population, that's an important thing to keep in mind. So um, this, is a, this is just a, a simplified model of this, uh, of, of this model of genetic influence. And, and essentially, there's a flow from genes to endophenotypes to uh, disorder. The, uh, the gene effects combine together to influence the endophenotypes, which can be traits or biological processes. And, uh, and these come together to influence the final outcome, which is the, the which is BPD, what we see. Now, um, and it's important to emphasize that within this model, uh, the model proposes that there is a decreasing level of complexity as we go from genetics to endophenotypes to phenotype. So you see here in this uh, in this graph, m multiple genes are uh, assumed to interact to influence uh, an endophenotype, and then these endophenotypes work together to uh, come together to ultimately influence the, the end, end result. And uh, at each level, a very important thing to add in is uh, the environmental influences. So uh, at each point, at the level of genetics, at the level of the endophenotype, and even at the level of disorder, environment plays a, a, a large effect plays a large role. So um, this, this, this graph here, this complex plane, illustrates uh, nicely the manner in which genes and environment interact to increase risk for something. Uh, like in this case, uh, uh, it's for antisocial behavior. So I just want to explain this. Let me use my pointer here. Um, on the, along the bottom here, on the x-axis, you see, you, um, you see uh, genotype, uh, basically genetic profile. And we range from susceptible to resistant. And uh, along this front axis, this would be the z-axis, we have uh, environmental hazardous, the environmental situation or the environmental influence ranging from a hazardous to a uh, protective. And then uh, along the top, along this axis, we basically have plotted the risk of antisocial behavior. Now, if you can kind of extend out in three dimensions to somewhere on this plane, you could think of any, pl any point on this plane as, as being, uh, let's say, the probability of engaging in some kind of antisocial behavior. Now, as you can see, um, variation in the genetic profile mediates the effect of the environmental hazard on the risk. So, um, for example, an individual with a resistant genetic profile has a very low risk of engaging in antisocial behavior in a protective environment, but what has a steeply increasing risk as the environmental hazard increases. Now, uh, in contrast, you look at the individual with a susceptible genetic profile. This person has a moderate degree of engaging in, in this type of behavior, even in a protective environment. Um, and then as you, uh, the hazard increases, uh, the risk goes up dramatically. Now, I just also want to uh, want to emphasize that you see that the terms uh, used to describe the genetic profile are really uh, the relatively neutral uh, in the sense that there's no uh, you know pathological and or, or deficit necessarily implied here it, it really uh, susceptibility uh, is you can think about it as a vulnerability but it doesn't necessarily imply a, a deficit it just apply, implies a difference relative to um, what's maybe more common. So, um, so that's the the, the model uh, of of, uh, of this uh, type of, of interaction. So, if we apply it to BPD, uh, an, an important first issue to address is whether uh, there's any evidence supporting the idea that there are a, there is a heritable component to BPD. Um, so. Heritability can be defined as the amount on average of the individual differences that we observe in a trait or a disorder that are in some way attributable, uh, attributable to genetic variation. So it's a broad concept and basically it, it captures uh, the range of, uh, of what we see in the presentation of a particular disorder. Uh, 
Um, the answer to this question with BPD is that actually there seems to be quite a bit of evidence supporting this. Uh, there have been three studies so far. These are called behavioral genetic studies uh, of BPD. And from these studies, essentially the estimate has concluded that it's probably somewhere around 50 to 60 percent of the variance, uh, the variance in in a BPD presentation is attributable to genetics or some interaction of genetics. Um, in addition, a, a recent, a very recently, a study just came out showing what's called linkage to an area of the of the genome. That's a, an even stronger, that's even stronger evidence of a, of a genetic influence. And taken together, these studies suggest that there is indeed that genes do indeed play some role in in the etiology of BPD. It doesn't tell us exactly what role genes play or how many genes are involved. Uh, it, this kind of research just tells us that genetic influences in some seem to play an important role. Um, to put heritability in context, consider the, uh, the, the, the physical traits that I presented earlier, like eye color and uh, hair color. The heritability for those, um, those traits is above 0.9, is above 90 percent. And that suggests that there's very little environmental influence on things like that. And uh, in contrast with BPD, Approximately 40 percent, give or take, we'll say 40 to 50 percent, comes from environmental influences of some form. And it's, as with genetics, it doesn't really tell us what kind of influences. It just gives us kind of a percentage and a breakdown. So um, there are several different types of, of effects we can have. I mean, these are all different types of association, but they're association to different things. And I just wanted to highlight them. Uh, because they're uh, very important, I, I think, to be thinking about with BPD. Um, one, one issue uh, is that um, we, we're assuming with genetic research with this disorder, of course, that there are genes associated with the disorder itself, with BPD, or with the endophenotypes that underlie it. Um, another thing that complicates uh, the issue is that genes can be linked to Comorbid disorders independently of BPD, like mood disorders, uh, we see very high rates of mood disorder diagnosis in BPD samples, and so this is a, a definitely a complicating issue. Uh, thirdly, genes can be linked to associated behaviors independently of an association with a particular diagnosis. So, for example, suicide uh, is something there's a lot of research on the genetics of suicide that tends to uh, cross cover multiple diagnostic groups. And, uh, and lastly, um, th there can be environmental influences in all these effects, so, uh, so that's another complicating issue. Uh, I, don't, I can't go into a lot of detail because of time constraints, but I'm going to summarize a few uh, studies that we've done, some findings from a few studies that illustrate uh, these types of, of findings. So um, to begin with a genetic influence on the disorder itself, we looked at whether a gene that uh, is involved in coding for uh, an enzyme called tryptophan hydroxylase was uh, associated with BPD or whether it was actually associated with major depressive disorder. Tryptophan hydroxylase is uh, it's what's called a rate limiting enzyme. It, it's an enzyme that's involved in serotonin production and uh, it's the first enzyme uh, that's involved in a series of steps that convert uh, tryptophan, which is a, an amino acid we get from our diet, into serotonin. Um, it's, we chose to look at this particular gene because there's a lot of research linking it to uh, impulsive behaviors, aggressive behaviors, um, suicide, violent suicide in particular, things like that. Um, serotonin is, is a very important molecule in, uh, in many bodily systems, and so tryptophan hydroxylase can be found really throughout the body, so it's kind of difficult to, to exactly and precisely nail down uh, how this gene could be exerting an influence. Um, the polymorphism that we study is, is a single nucleotide polymorphism, like I was talking about earlier, and what it results in is uh, three genotypes because of the, the switch between nucleotides, CC, CA, and AA, and I'm going to refer to those in the next slide. Now the A, uh, the A the allele, we'll call it, is the risk allele. The CC genotype is the one that's most common in the population, and when there's the polymorphism, uh, which is a kind of a mutation in a sense, the A is what we see, so it's a different version. So uh, this is a graph of the results from, uh, from that study, and it's basically a, a plot of uh, frequencies uh, of genotypes in two different groups. It, we compared, uh, these are all uh, uh, Caucasian 
patients, which uh, we tend to do that in genetic research to eliminate what we call stratification. It's a group of uh, people diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, but also with major depression, and uh, healthy controls with no diagnoses on any axes. And so what this shows is that we, we and coming back to the risk allele issue, we group together people with any, uh, any A's. So people with two risk alleles or with one have an AC genotype. We group them together and we compare them to the people with this common genotype, CC. And what we found was that in the BPD group, there was a much higher percentage of the risk allele carriers. And uh, this is basically the, the standard way of looking at genetic association. From this type of analysis, we can conclude that this gene is indeed associated with the disorder. Now, it doesn't tell us what it does or what role it plays. It just tells us that, that there's an association between the gene and the genotype and a particular disorder. So, um, as I said, all, all these patients were diagnosed with major depression as well, so it was important for us to figure out whether what we were seeing was an association between uh, the gene and depression or uh, the gene and, and borderline personality disorder. So we did an addi additional comparison where we basically did the exact same uh, comparison, but we used a control group of uh, patients with depression but with no access to diagnoses. So um, it, the, essentially the results, the results were very similar. They were not quite as significant, but uh, the conclusions were the same. The, the risk allele still distinguish these two groups. And from this, we are able to conclude that the gene was indeed associated with BPD rather than uh, being associated with mood disorders, uh, with the mood disorder that was so highly comorbid in this group. So um, another issue that we wanted to address in this research program was whether uh, any environmental influences acted as mediators in this relationship. Uh, and this is coming back to the gene environment interaction that we, I was t talking about earlier. So um, we chose to study what's an often cited risk factor for BPD, which is a history of childhood trauma. And um, the data we used for this was self-reported history of a physical and sexual abuse in our sample. So um, we often see high rates of trauma in BPD samples, but um, as far as genetic research is concerned, uh, it's important to, to, to verify whether we can uh, view childhood trauma as a, as a true environmental risk factor. And uh, this, I put this box here, this is from uh, an article by uh, Terry Moffitt and Caspi and John Rutter, um, in, in which they, they outlined uh, the methodology for approaching gene environment interaction studies. And, and they give three criteria for determining whether something is indeed a true risk. And so the first criteria is marked variability in response uh, to among people who are exposed to the risk factor. Uh, the next is a plausible effect of the environmental risk factor on biological systems involved in the disorder. And then the third is evidence that the risk factor is a true pathogen, an environmental pathogen. And what that means is basically that um, can we say that the risk factor is not just another genetically mediated uh, effect. So if so that's a confound, right? If, if it's a genetically, so let's say uh, if it was something that was genetically uh, transmitted or if we hypothesize that was uh, that there was a genetic effect determining or influencing the prevalence of abuse, then we wouldn't be able to say that it was a true environmental risk factor. Now um, there's a large literature on uh, variability of consequences of abuse. Uh, there's also a large literature on um, the neurobiological effects of all types of trauma. Um, and thirdly, in answer to the last question, we, we actually know that uh, abuse perpetrators are often unrelated to the victim. Uh, and in this particular sample, we actually looked at that issue and, and we found a very high uh, percentage of, uh, of our um, participants reported uh, abuse perpetrators as being outside of the family. Um, so, so we concluded that it was something that we could indeed look at in this type of model. So, um, it, it, I, uh, this, this, we looked at the same sample, the, the, the BPD and depression sample that I presented earlier, and um, we looked at whether a history of physical, sexual, or both um, increased risk for uh, being diagnosed with BPD in the presence of this TPH1 allele that I, I mentioned earlier. So this, in this graph, we have the cases grouped by abuse history, 
um, along the, the, the Y axis, you have percentage of people who in the groups who meet a BPD diagnosis. And then along the, the bottom, you have different categories. Group the same way as earlier with the risk allele in the blue, with the blue bars, and uh, the people with the more common, the common variant, variant the C, C genotype, in the purple. Um, so when the data is broken down this way, you see that it suggests that the risk for BPD increases uh, approximately linearly with, with increasing severity of abuse, but only in the group with uh, a risk allele. And um, so this nicely illustrates um, the, the, uh, the, the, the risk probability you saw in that earlier graph with antisocial behavior you see the interaction between gene and uh, environment. Now, um, I also want to I want to highlight that uh, in the people with both um, physical and sexual abuse with a C allele with the C C genotype, there's virtually no difference in rates of BPD with comparing that group to people with no history of abuse. So, so the the main point here uh, is two things. One is that the the gene effect doesn't operate in isolation, but two is that uh, it, the uh, abuse history also doesn't operate in isolation. And the effect size here is actually much stronger than the original effect size with the first association. So you see how adding in uh, additional information, additional variables can increase our, our, our power to predict these kinds of things. So um, the last type of uh, effect I want to, want to talk about is um, associated behaviors, genetic influences on associated behaviors, and I mentioned suicide earlier. So this is another thing that we wanted to look at. Um, we wanted to see if there were any influences on suicide risk that were independent of BPD. So um, what we looked at was a gene called COMPT, uh, it stands for catecholmethyltransferase. This is an, an enzyme uh, in, the, in the brain that's involved in breaking down catecholamines like dopamine. Um, in contrast to the first polymorphism, it is actually uh, what's called a functional polymorphism, and that means that it actually causes a change in the functioning of this enzyme. So people with this risk allele, with a risk genotype, actually have an enzyme which uh, is not, doesn't function quite as well as uh, what is seen in most of the population. So it's a reduced uh, functionality. So this uh, graphic just illustrates what, uh, what I mean. People with a GG genotype are, are people who have the common variant and they, these are, let's say, dopamine molecules, catecholamines going in uh, on the, from the left here, and then um, metabolites coming out on the right. And so uh, the common variant, there's high rates of metabolism, and as you go down, increased number of risk alleles, the rates of, of metabolic activity decrease. And what this leads to is an increase in things like dopamine in the brain and a reduction in uh, the metabolites that are associated with breakdown of dopamine. So um, this graph uh, is basically a very similar comparison to the one I presented earlier, and it shows percentage of uh, people with BPD in the different groups broken down by risk allele. And um, the important point here is that the, the original comparison we did was actually comparing BPD to controls. And when we did that comparison, we found no difference in, in gene frequencies. Um, but when we broke things down by suicide attempters and, and people without a history of suicide, we found something very interesting, and that's uh, the fact that in the BPD attempters, we found a very high rate of, a very high percentage of risk allele carriers. In contrast, in the BPD uh, non-attempters, people without a history of suicide, what we found was an, a higher rate of the common variant relative to the healthy controls. And so what this suggests is that perhaps this polymorphism um, has some protective effect as well. And this comes back to the susceptibility um, issue with genetics, with the a genotype and a gene profile. So um, the implications of genetic findings, uh, just a couple of things I wanted to highlight. Uh, one is, um, Genetics can tell us a lot about etiology. Hopefully, um, we will um, we can learn some valuable information about etiology of BPD, gain some new insight into perhaps um, some mechanisms of BPD that we haven't discovered yet or haven't thought about. Um, genetics can also tell us uh, an informed treatment development, 
uh, identify potential targets for drug development uh, and could potentially identify vulnerabilities that we could address therapeutically or psychotherapeutically. So uh, in the future, um, we need to just continue working to discover uh, these genetic vulnerabilities. We need to uh, do more research understanding the etiology, the environmental factors that are involved. Um, as I said, work is just beginning on endophenotypes, and so um, work needs to continue developing these aspects. Um, the next step uh, from genetic association, which is really what I present today, is uh, something that's called genome-wide association. This is where we look at the whole genome, and uh, that gives us a lot of uh, good information on places to look for, for genes that we might not have thought of or that might not uh, occur to us without uh, being pointed there. Um, I talked about gene binding interaction. I also want to add in, emphasize, with genetics, replication is critically important. These types of studies need to be replicated and they need to be uh, validated. And so it's, it's typically quite a long process from an initial finding to concluding that something seems to be a true uh, solid effect that we can start to build on. So, um, so that process is important. So um, several, several people have highlighted the fact that uh, there was a time when, when BPD was thought of as a disorder that was basically environmentally determined. And um, in contrast to this view and in agreement with the two theorists I presented earlier, uh, and with actually a substantial amount of clinical theory, it, it looks like both genes and environment interact to increase risk for, uh, for BPD. So um, future research will be really helpful in elaborating this model. I think it'll really be important. Um, thanks for your, for your time. Thank you. Um, okay, before I, I have a couple questions, but just before I answer them, I just want to uh, point out and a few people who have worked with me uh, and helped me out here. Uh, genetics research is a, is a complex undertaking that requires a lot of people. And uh, so um, I just want to highlight uh, someone I work very closely with is Barbara Stanley in the audience. Uh, also, uh, Dr. John Mann, who is a director of our research division at the Columbia University, and uh, a lot of my collaborators. So, let's see. Can you compare the percentage of genetic influences in BPD to other disorders? Um, well, I can compare to a few, I guess, to put things in context. Um, the, as I said, the range for the estimates for genetic uh, contributions to BPD are probably somewhere in the range of 50 to 60 percent. Um, another disorder where there's a, a real interest in genetics is with schizophrenia. And so estimates of heritability for schizophrenia range upwards of more near around 80 percent. So, um, so in that case, it's assumed that uh, genes play an even bigger role. Um, in, in contrast, I guess, uh, let's see, something like major depression, I think I saw heritability for that recently. I, I believe it was somewhere around, um, somewhere in the 0.3 to 0.4 range. So 30 to about, let's say 40 percent. Uh, conservatively, so um, so there, there's there's a range. Self-reported abuse. Uh, so the self-reported abuse history. How do you calculate in the risk that self-reported abuse in BPD may be markedly different from the actual occurrence of abuse? That's a very good point. Uh, yeah, that's exactly why I pointed out that this was a self-report of abuse history. Uh, it's a, it's a kind of a, the measure that we used in this case was really just a, a very crude measure, uh, just based on their, was it just a question about whether they had any history of physical or sexual abuse and when did it occur. Um, so we don't have uh, any data validating it per se. We have other measures that we haven't looked at, which also collect information, more detailed information. But, uh, but it's a very good it's a very good point to raise and that's the fact that you know we we don't uh, it's important to, to, to validate um, environmental risk factors if we're going to be using them in genetic studies so. uh, does environment such as trauma particularly chronic trauma after or affect genes so it, I, I, 
does environment it looks does environment such as environmental effects such as trauma affect I'm, I think it uh, alter or affect the genes uh, that's a that's a very good question and I'm glad it was raised it, it that it's it actually uh, is the case that environmental influences can interact with genetic effects but can also um, change the action of genes and um, this is through uh, so we have, there's something called epigenetics which is really the study of the influence of environmental uh, extra genetic influences on the expression of our genes and so there's this process uh, called uh, methylation in which genes basically get um, get closed up they get uh, and prevent and it prevents them from being expressed and so uh, and in, in our experiences directly influence the expression of our genes in this way so so yes it's 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 true that uh, that abuse or any other kind of stressor can can certainly affect the expression of genes there's a very interesting um, Michael Meany is his name there's a lot of interesting research on the effects of maternal stress with animals with in rats the effect of maternal stress uh, or maternal behavior on the expression of and uh, the expression of uh, receptors that are involved in stress uh, response so if anyone's interested in that um, you can email me I'd be happy to send references or you can find it on the web uh, would you please go over the slide of are we done okay last question would you please go over the slide of BPD and trauma and abuse sure So um, in that slide, basically, um, just to reiterate, it, it showed that there was an interaction between abuse history and um, and the genotype. And what it showed was that on, on this axis was percentage of people with who met the criteria for borderline personality disorder. I remember this is a whole sample of all people with a major depression, so a full clinical sample. And so what it showed was uh, what it shows is that in people with the risk allele with an a allele the people with uh, there was an increasing risk of people diagnosed in this group with BPD uh, based on increasing severity of abuse but this was only in people with the risk allele and people without this genetic susceptibility the rates of BPD were no different whether you had reported no history of abuse or whether you reported a severe history of abuse so I hope that clarifies. If anyone has any questions, you could certainly ask me afterwards. Thank you.